Lord. The passage from AIB that interested the court before lunch, I should just like to take the court to the page before um, the first identified by my Lord Lord Justice Snowden. That's 1144. AIB is 48 of the uh, tab 51. 51. One one four four, my lord. Yeah. Now, it, it seems to me that this um, passage towards the foot of the page is of a piece with the later observations about Catherine Darby. Uh, lord Reed says a further limitation arose from the plaintiff's responsibility not to act unreasonably when the plaintiff, after due notice and opportunity, failed to take the most obvious steps to alleviate his or her losses then it could rightly be said that the plaintiff has been the author of his own misfortune. Sorry, I haven't kept up with you. Where are you reading from? At the foot of page 1144, my lord. It's paragraph 87. Yeah, I see, yeah. So plaintiff's responsibility not to act unreasonably. Yeah. Um, plainly, that, that doesn't apply. Uh, the liquidators did work strenuously to uh, try to get in the, these assets. And then over the page, the passage that my, my Lord Lord Justice Snowden identified before lunch, it's the, the passage from McClacken J, uh, paragraph 89. And it's the, the last seven or eight lines that are absolutely key. <coughs> the plaintiff will not be required to mitigate, as the term is used in law, but losses resulting from clearly unreasonable behaviour on the part of the plaintiff will be adjudged to flow from that behaviour and not from the breach where the trustee's breach permits the wrongful or negligent acts of third parties, thus establishing a direct link between the breach and the loss, the resulting loss will be recoverable. Where there is no such link, the loss must be recovered from the third parties. It certainly wasn't the plaintiff's negligence. The most probable explanation, my lords, is that the Sheikh was orchestrating what happened in July 2017 as the controlling mind of all relevant entities, or that it was his breach, i.e. the misappropriation of the 891,000 shares in March 2016, and the liquidator's subsequent keenness to get those in, and not to just uh, leave it, that led the things that happened in July 2017 to happen. So it was, it was a, an avoidance uh, an avoidance tactic of exactly the kind identified by my Lord Lord Justice Snowden yesterday. Um, a further lightly explanation is that it was the liquidator's actions in trying to enforce that caused what happened in July 2017 to happen. And I would again emphasise the temporal proximity of uh, the 29th of February 2016 resolution uh, with the meeting of Mr. Chris and the Sheikh on the 2nd of February 2016, <coughs> and the temporal proximity between the transfer to MBI International Holdings on the 23rd of June 2017, with the recognition order granted by Registrar Derrett in the Chancery Division on the 13th of June 2017. Those are the likely hypotheses, as just as a matter of common sense and inference, reasonable inferences to be drawn from the Sheikh's conduct throughout this uh, liquidation. But actually, we don't really know because we haven't been told anything. And although we accept that the judge said in the, in the judgment, and I, I, Mr. Crow referred to this yesterday, that the, the restructuring wasn't a breach of duty to the company, but that doesn't mean it didn't flow from the Sheikh's antecedent breaches by, mean, by, by which he misappropriated the 891,000 shares. Really, if the Sheikh is saying it would have happened anyway if there had been no breach, uh, no misappropriation of the shares, then we would respond, what is it that is supposed to have happened? Because there's no real evidence of the so-called restructuring in July 2017. And there's no, certainly no, evidence of value of the shares after that date. So the Sheikh is really 
asserting that by means of this, this thing that happened in July 2017 that he won't tell us about, the value of our loss as at the date of trial must be nothing. But if, if that is his position, then it is surely for him to prove it according to trite and basic principles of fiduciary accounting, um, namely, in this case, that the burden of proof is on the defaulting fiduciary. If, if he wants to um, say that uh, things that would have happened anyway have happened. In this case, we, we don't even know what the things are in any, in any detail. Uh, and there's certainly no evidence that they would have happened anyway. I emphasise that the judge is careful, not to, careful in the judgment not to find that the shares were worthless at trial. But if there had been no breach, if we are in... in, in counterfactual territory of looking at what would have happened but for the breach, the shape wouldn't have had the opportunity to do what he did in 2017 because he wouldn't have had, the, or the rather, JJW Guernsey wouldn't have had the 891,000 shares in 2017 at all had there been no breach. But why would that have affected the Sheikh's ability to do whatever he did? Well, because we're told that he, that we're told that JJW Inc., of which our company was an 11.2% shareholder, but for the breach disposed of all its assets such that it was left with none. And you can't do that uh, without uh, the 11.2% share, the shareholder knowing about it. Well, you didn't know about what ha had happened even though you held 129,000 shares. In that situation, it's not open to the shape, we say, to um, set up the, his, his own dishonesty. Uh, which involved lying to the court, lying on oath, uh, in defending a claim brought in equity for compensation. I would like to show your lordships what the judge said in the consequentials judgment <coughs> on, the, on these unknown factors, uh, because it does shed a little bit of light on what the judge was thinking. Now, if I could invite your lordships to take up the supplementary bundle and turn to page 212. If your lordships would care to read paragraphs 36 and 37 to, to yourselves. Seems to be about interest. The judgment is about interest, yes. But but the reason I'm showing your lordships this passage is because it, it shows that that the judge was the judge had in mind well in mind <coughs> that there is no way of getting to the bottom of what happened in 2017, and that there may very well have been benefits accruing to the sheikh from those dealings. Uh, and it's impossible to get behind any of that because it's, it's effectively it's a, it's a black box that we've got no insight into as defrauded beneficiary. And, and yet the Sheikh is purporting to put us to proof of what happened in 2017 when we can't possibly know. And that is why the judge did what, in my submission, uh, a judge ought to do in this situation, which is do the best with, that she could with the evidence she had. Did you seek an account? No, we, an account was pleaded and um, it's recorded in the judgment that I said that if, it's a, if, it, if it were a choice between the claim being dismissed or an order for account,
account and I've taken order for, for an account, but we were we elected, as we were entitled to, to seek an immediate order of extra compensation. And we did that because of the impossibility of taking an account, because the Sheikh, we, we had by this point been involved with the Sheikh for, for years, including examinations at court and, and um, uh, a trial that had um, turned into a monster. And it was, it, uh, an account would have simply been, been impossible, my Lord. I mean, an account, as I understand it in the strict set, it's often used rather loosely as an expression. Um, an account is calling upon a fiduciary to literally account for their dealings with the trust property. Mm. And it can be a preliminary step to either seeking an order for payment of such sums as may become apparent or due on the account, namely, for example, profits made through use of the asset, um, or it, it can be the it could be the basis for seeking an award of equitable compensation. Yes, and the the so, so where's the election that you mentioned? The well, we could elect for an account or for an immediate payment of equitable compensation. That's that's my understanding of. Yes, yeah, sorry, that suggests that. Um, in, inconsistent. You elect for one or the other. I'm saying I, I don't understand the that account is. The, it may be that it's just terminology. I mean, I think you're saying, as a practical matter, you didn't seek an account because you thought that the that the shape would never comply with the order for an account. It's it's more that there would be no advance on the evidence that we had, and the the principle underlying the substitutive and reparative measures are derived from. The accounting process, so substitutive performance, is is meant to reflect an accounting common form, and reparative is meant to reflect an account on the basis of willful default. And it's it, it the, the reason we didn't want to in, embark on a further accounting process was was we considered that the evidence was as good as it was ever going to be, and we invited the judge, which and she accepted the invitation to do the best she could with the evidence that was before the court. And a substitutive measure, which is what the judge awarded, is meant to reflect an accounting common form, which is just deliver up the asset or its value. And she valued the asset on the basis of the best evidence that she had, which was the 2016 accounts. And she could also have valued it on the basis of the statement of affairs, but she chose the uh, 2016 accounts and we didn't appeal from that. Now, as, as, on, as to the burden of proof, my lords, I'd just like to show you what the, what the judge said um, on that and the way she directed herself. If I could invite your lordships to... Oh, just before, sorry, just to par before departing from the consequential judgment, I'd, I'd just emphasise that four lines up from the bottom in paragraph 36, the judge again doesn't make a finding and it's clear that she hasn't made a finding that the shares were worthless at the date of trial. She says the fact that they may have, they may later, may later have become worthless does not appear to me to neutralise the potential for profit to be made. So she's again agnostic about that, but she's she's saying well even if they are worthless, then this is this is the the approach that's been taken. And again, in my submission, she was right to do so. If I can invite your lordships to look again at the core bundle and turn to page 149. And the, the judge first directed herself by reference to a decision of my lord. Newey's at, at first instance, paragraph 167, case of GHLM trading in Maru. Uh, she, she directs herself according to this proposition. Once it is shown that a company director has received company money, it is for him to show that the payment was proper. And for, for money, in my submission, one can read assets in, at large. And then at paragraph 169, the judge directs herself according to Re Mumtaz Properties' decision of 
leading judgment given by Lady Justice Arden. Uh, and if I could invite your lordships to uh, skim read, uh, in the interest of time, the uh, paragraphs 15, 16 and 17 over the page 150. Is Montaz relevant in these circumstances? Because what Montaz is all about is a situation where a director, or in this that case, de facto directors, um, haven't produced to the office holder the books and records of the company. And what Lady Justice Arden was saying is, well, not having produced the books and records of the company, they can't rely upon their own default. Is that strictly applicable here? It's a, well, it's a, it's a similar principle. I, I appreciate the facts aren't aren't four square with these facts, but it's it's when someone says that things have happened, uh, uh, says that things have happened properly, and they are unable to produce documentation, having been a company director required to keep such documentation, and of course in the case of a liquidation, produce it. Uh, and there was an order, I should mention, there was an order of registrar from Mullen made in August 2017 requiring the Sheikh to deliver up the books and records of the company, which he was already required to do. And, which and company are we dealing with? The, uh, sorry, the company in liquidation. But in terms of the sale of the... Sale, in terms of the transfer of the assets, they were assets of JJW Inc. Yes, I, I don't. I don't suggest the facts are, are identical. But what what we've well, got? Well, so just just to be clear, JJW yes. Inc. Yes, so it wasn't a party. No, no, it wasn't. No, the, but the the, the the submission is that when there's a company director in this case, the Sheikh, who has assets of the company in his hands, so he's, he's in the position of a, of a trustee with accounting responsibilities for those assets, and he hasn't kept any record of what he's done, and he insists that certain things have been done properly, then he, he cannot rely on the lack of evidence, the lack of documentation to support the transaction having been proper. Uh, it's just, essentially, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a function of the burden of proof. It's exactly the same as the burden of proof, which is itself a function of the accounting obligation, or a consequence of the accounting obligation. He can't stand there with his arms folded and just say, prove it, to a defrauded beneficiary. I'll move on now, my lords, to um, uh, page 252 of uh, the core bundle. And this is where the judge is directing herself on the appropriate measure of compensation. And at paragraph 549, 11, uh, towards the top of that page, the judge directs herself according to judgment in libertarian where the claimant provides evidence of loss flowing from the relevant breach of duty, the onus lies on a defaulting fiduciary to disprove the apparent causal connection between the breach of duty and the loss, or particular aspects of the loss apparently flowing therefrom. Now that's, that's exactly this case, and when one's looking at the Caffrey and Darby um, Canson uh, dichotomy, uh, if I can put, put it that way, um, if the Sheikh wants to say it would have happened anyway, whatever it is for these purposes, then the burden is on him to show that he's on that side of the line. And it's instructive to actually look at uh, permanent Justice Ribeiro's uh, judgment to show the context in which that um, observation is made. If I could invite your Lordships to take up the authorities bundle and turn to page 943.
Uh, the relevant paragraph is 93, but the reason I've taken your Lordships to the judgment is in order to show that that observation was made by the judge immediately after uh, citations from Ree Dawson, which is a, a case Mr Crow referred to yesterday, and uh, Justice McClacklin's judgment in Canson, and having directed himself according to those authorities, the Hong Kong judge uh, sets out the, that the passage almost, if not actually word for word, how the judge has adopted it in our case. Before departing... Sorry, just, uh, yes. I just haven't read it properly. Um, before departing from this um, line, I would just make the observation that the, although an enormous amount of weight is placed by the Sheikh on the words in the, in the judge's finding of fact about realisation of the shares, where she says if it had been open to the liquidator to do so, where's that effect that may be debated, but it's, it's those qualifying words, if that's what they are, that the Sheikh relies on. The judge certainly didn't find that the shares wouldn't have been realised, and where the burden of proof is borne by the defaulting fiduciary, he has to show, uh, even to the extent we get into counterfactuals at all, which I, I say we don't, but to the extent we do, he has to show uh, that the liquidator wouldn't have realised them. In other words, the liquidator would have breached her um, duty to get in the assets of the company, in my submission. Oh, just hang on, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to quibble. But there's a distinction between the duty to get in and the duty to realise. Getting in means taking control of possession of assets which the company owns. Turning them to into money for distribution is a different duty. The two aren't the same. No, quite quite so, my lord, and I'm obliged your lordship for pulling me up on that. That's, that of course I accept that. I, I, I ought to have said realise. Because the liquidator has a decision to make as to when to realise. Of course. The liquidator doesn't automatically have to realise assets at the date which is disadvantageous. Right. Where you have assets which are fluctuating in value, let's say Bitcoin, um, you would, as a liquidator, you could well be criticised if you just said, OK, well, I'm just going to do it now, irrespective of fact that this is a fluctuating asset. It might be more difficult with Bitcoin because who knows, but there are good reasons why liquidators don't realise assets immediately. Yeah. And I recall doing a trial in front of your Lordship uh, on timing of realisation of assets, so yes, um, that, that, that is of course I absolutely accept. Uh, I'm just going to jump back now to, to where I was before lunch in order to ensure that I've, I've made my submissions on, on Re Ahmed. What we say is that Re Ahmed is a very different case <coughs> than that I gave uh, before the short adjournment. Critically, we say that that, that case uh, can, be, can be seen as a, sort of a, a case on its own. Uh, the principles of equitable compensation were not argued. In particular, it wasn't submitted that Target and AIB were inapt because they were about consensual transactions, and that's the, uh, that's the argument that we've been running today. Relatedly, the burden of proof was not argued in that case. The respondents in that case were Category 2 constructive trustees, so the accounting duty was different in origin. And so I say for all those reasons, the judge in, in the instant case was right to treat Riyamid as one in which the relevant principles were not argued, as she observes at paragraph 566 of the judgment. So that's what I say about Re Ahmed. I would also make the point, in case I don't get through all the cases on equitable compensation, I would, I would make the point that um, ITC and Furster and Auden, McKenzie and Patel 
both had uh, Lord Justice David Richards, as he then was, on the bench, and he was on the bench in Riyamek. And uh, in the case of ITC and Furster, that case was argued on the 18th of April 2018, which was less than a month just after Riyamid had been handed down on the 19th of March 2018. I, I so, don't know the logic of that, but I was one of the judges in that case. I have to say, I have, I'd be very surprised if Ahmed had been cited. Uh, my, my point isn't so much that Riyamid was cited. My you point think is that Justice David Richards might have remembered? <laughs> well, from, from, a, from a month before, it's, yes. it's possible, I would suggest, lightly. Uh, yes. Um, he, he would say, e even if he didn't specifically remember the case, um, I would res respectfully submit that, uh, that, that, that the learned judge would have been fully au fait with all the, all the relevant principles, and he would, he would have taken into account the sorts of features that were present in Riyamid before saying what he said in ITC and Furster and Auden McKendie and Patel. So it's a, it's a, it's a small point, but it's, 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 it, I, don't, I, I suggest it's unrealistic say that because it wasn't directly cited that therefore um, ITC and Furster and Auden Mackenzie and Patel somehow have a question mark over them. I mean Auden Mackenzie and Patel it was, it was, was clearly properly argued and it was a three chancery, three justice bench um, and perhaps the same can't be said for, for Riyamid. So what we say is that Target and AIB uh, don't give rise to a, an approach that is apt to be argued by a company director who misappropriates company assets. And the, the case, the first case that I rely on to make that good is Bearstow and Queen's Moat. If I could invite your lordships to turn to uh, tab 32 with the authority's funding. This was about uh, equitable compensation being paid for unlawful distributions. Uh, if I could invite your lordship to turn to page 507, no, uh, page 530, please. If your lordships would be Kind enough to read, please, paragraphs 49 on 530 and 54 over the page on 531. I draw out of that is that um, Lord Justice Robert Walker, as he then was, uh, makes the point that the, the case before him was wholly different from Target Holdings. Um, and I would respectfully submit that what was happening in Bearstow and Queen's Moat House, namely misappropriations by company directors, is far more like the instant case than uh, Target and AIB. I don't submit that Bairstow and Queen's Moat House was exactly analogous to, to this case, uh, but what I do suggest is that it shows that Target and AIB are not the be-all and end-all of equitable compensation uh, and will be distinguished where it's appropriate to do so. Something similar happened in ITC and Furster, and I'll, I'll take this one quickly. Uh, if your Lordships would care to turn to page 1234, and this is tab 56.
again this is uh, concerns cash not shares it's unlawful remuneration but the, the key point is that Lord Justice David Richards as he then was says um, uh, I find it difficult to see that they could prevail about they being causation points uh, in this case as an answer to a claim by way of equitable compensation for payment of sums dishonestly taken as quote remuneration end quote without authority the facts bear no relation to those in cases such as Target and AIB and uh, uh, I see there that uh, my Lord Lord Justice Newey there agrees with that so the the uh, proposition is that uh, Target and AIB will be readily distinguished where there is misappropriation, particularly dishonest misappropriation by a company director. Warden Mackenzie, now, if I can invite your lordships to turn to page 1243, which is tab 57. foot of that page at paragraph 47 Lord Justice David Richards as he then was finds that in the context of a trust established to give effect to a particular transaction where the contract defines the parameters of the trust the citation from Lord Toulson in AIB and where the trustee has prescribed duties for that purpose the trustee's obligation to make good any un unauthorised application of the trust funds is limited by the loss which the beneficiary would have suffered if the trustee had fully performed its duties Lord Toulson repeatedly made this point, which represents the ratio of his judgment. But critically, it, this, is, this is qualified on the basis that it is a trust established to give effect to a particular transaction supported by a contract with prescribed duties. Uh, of course, it hardly needs saying, my lords, that a dishonest misappropriation of company assets will, will not be in that class. And at paragraph 49 on page 1244, Three lines down, Lord Justice David Richards finds that Target and AIB are restricted to circumstances where the beneficiary obtained the full benefit for which it bargained, or where if the trustee had fully performed its obligations, the loss would have been less than the amount of the unauthorised payment made by the trustee. There is no, and in the last sentence, there is no analogy with the decision in AIB. So again, readily, readily distinguished. I'm, I'm going to take the propositions on substitutive and reparative uh, equitable compensation from Davison forward, and I'm, I'm going to refer to the first instance decision of Mr. David Holland, King's Counsel, um, simply because it, it, his analysis of this is described as impeccable uh, when it went to appeal by, by Sir Lancelot Henderson, and it, and it is very, it's very clearly expressed. If I could invite your Lordships to turn to page 1308, which is page uh, tab 60. If I could respectfully invite your Lordships to read paragraphs 106 to 108. Eight on the page, please.
thank you, my lord. Uh, in my submission, we are clearly, as the judge held in my submission rightly, in the substitutive category as set out in paragraph 106 there, namely misappropriation of existing trust property. What does misappropriation mean as opposed to misapplication? I mean, the, the Sheikh did not misappropriate, he misapplied. Mm. Well, if one's applying a sort of Burnham Fielding analysis, which is that a, an entity that is essentially a cat's paw for the defaulting fiduciary, um, then it could be said that he misappropriated it in that sense through a, a corporate vehicle of which he was sole director and controlling mind, namely JJW Guernsey. But even if, if we're not in that, in that territory, then nonetheless it is a misapplication. And in my submission, the principle should be exactly the same, especially where, the same point, the entity receiving is a company wholly under his control. And your Lordship will, will recall the judge's observations of paragraph 36 and 37 of the consequential judgment where she talks about the, the benefits that were likely to have accrued to the Sheikh or his, his empire. Uh, my paraphrase, not the judge's words. I mean, I understand, I understand why somebody who misappropriates to themselves in breach of duty an asset can't be heard to say when asked either to put it back or put it back in the state that they took it. Oh, but I could have had, I could have taken it out lawfully anyway. Mm. Which I think is the sort of, um, I can't remember which case that was. Um, it's certainly one of the cases. You know, I, I would have, would have we just seen it. I'm sorry, I can't yes, it's the Orton McKenzie case. I yeah, believe. okay. Yeah. So I certainly understand that. But if a trustee misapplies trust property, but due to an entirely extraneous circumstance, the property would have diminished substantially in value if it had remained in the trust at all times. Mm. I'm struggling at the moment to square the idea that, that the trustee should not be entitled to say, well, if you're suing me for compensation for my breach of duty, if I had performed my duty, the loss would still have occurred because it was due to the, you know, the mm. invasion of Ukraine or whatever it is on, yes. on these well, shares. Intervening acts of third parties yeah. have nothing to do yeah. with, nothing to with do me. With me. Yeah. Nothing to do with me. It would have happened well, anyway. So what, primary, primary submission, my Lord, is that your Lordship should follow this, Davis and Ford. But if your Lordships aren't with me on that and you, and you do want to explore the counterfactual of what, what, hap what, what would have happened uh, if, if there hadn't been a breach but for the breach, then we're back into uh, the Catherine Darby Hansen dichotomy that your Lordship invited me to look at over, over lunch. And I think I've, I've said uh, as much as I can say on that, namely <coughs> that the burden of proof is on the shake, um, not only to prove that the loss would still have been occasioned, but even what it is that he says occasioned the loss, and, and indeed to, to show the loss. I mean, we, we, we don't even know, we, we don't know what the shares are. We, we, we haven't had any visibility on where the shares even are um, after 26th of March 2020, which is the most recent share register we've seen. We didn't know who, where legal title to the shares was at the start of trial. We didn't know at the end of trial. We don't know now. Um, so we don't even know where the shares are. We don't even know if they exist still in the same form. We simply don't know. Um, and so how, at the risk of repeating myself, how on earth can it, can it possibly be just or in accordance with any of the principles we've looked at for the Sheikh to put us to proof as the defrauded beneficiary of something that may or may not have happened and may or may not have had certain consequences. So my Lord, I'd now like to go on to Davis and Ford when it reached the Court of Appeal. If your Lordship's case turns to page 1444, 1444, that is at tab 64. And I should like to commend to your Lordship's the whole of um, ground F. And that's the discussion at uh, paragraph.
paragraphs 125 to 132 inclusive, starting on page 1444. Sadly, time does not permit me to go through that in detail, but I'd just like to show your Lordships the conclusion to that discussion. This is at page 1447. The, the, the court, or Sir Lancelot Henderson, goes through uh, Underhill and the various cases that I've made reference to today. And then there's a mention of FHR and Mancarios at uh, paragraph 130 at the top of page 1447. And that, of course, was a case about a bribe. And what the Court of Appeal decides about that uh, is that, and I'm reading five lines from the bottom of paragraph 131, that in such cases, namely bribe cases, as it seems to me, the right approach is that the principal may seek a substitutive remedy in respect of existing trust property which is misapplied by the agent, or an account of profits made by the agent, but that if the principal elects not to seek an account of profits, he should be confined to a reparative remedy compensating him for any actual loss caused by the breach of duty. And then uh, paragraph 132, one sees very, very clearly set out the, the distinction between cases where one applies a substitutive performance measure and cases where one applies a reparative measure. Because what Mr. Holland King's counsel did at first instance was he, and this is at paragraph 132, one see, he, he ordered that the defendant should pay 170,000 odd in respect of funds that belonged to the company that were converted to his own use. That's a substitutive remedy. Um, uh, valued at the date of breach, you're not allowed to consider the counterfactual. Uh, but in terms of the, the, the misdirection of a corporate opportunity, so something that the company didn't have yet but, but hopes to get, uh, which is analogous to a target AIB type situation where the, the, the lenders should have got in security, or rather the fiduciary should have got in security for the lenders, uh, a reparative measure is ordered. And uh, your lordship will, lordships will see but in the, in the penultimate line of paragraph 132, uh, Mr. Uh, Holland's judgment is, descri is described as uh, impeccable. I'd now like to say by now like to make some submissions by way of a cross check on what the position would have been in damages had uh, this been a claim in conversion, and what what we the, the reason we're going to touch on this briefly is because. We submit that if the if the Sheikh is correct in his contention that equitable compensation should lead to the same result as common law damages, then well, let's see what the result would have been. Um, the liquidator's starting point on this is that a defrauded beneficiary cannot possibly be worse off against their dishonest fiduciary than someone suing uh, in co a common law would have been. I'd like to show your Lordships the relevant extract from McGregor on damages at page uh, 1581 of the Authorities Bundle, which is at tab 72. There's a discussion here under the heading fall. There's a discussion here of, of two cases that are described as being claims for conversion of shares. And in the first, Soloway and McLaughlin, the defendant was liable for the market value of the shares at the date of the conversion. Uh, and it, it ex goes on to explain that the defendant stockbrokers converted shares of their claimant client by selling them. Uh, subsequently, when the claimant closed his account with them, they bought the same number of shares in the same company at a substantially lower price to which the market had fallen since the sale and conversion, and handed these over to the claimant, who took them without knowledge of the conversion. Later, he discovered the conversion, sued for damages, and was awarded the value of the shares at the date of the conversion, less the value of the shares bought in replacement, as at the time when he accepted them. And then uh, paragraph 
paragraph 38 15 towards the bottom of that page there's a reference to the Privy Council decision BBMM Finance Hong Kong where Soloway and McLaughlin was uh, applied and in that case the defendants hadn't actually made a profit because for unaccountable reasons they hadn't presented the cheque that they'd received on the sale but uh, nonetheless uh, they were uh, liable for the value of the conversion at the date of the conversion. A case going the other way, uh, Brandy's Goldschmidt and Co. Uh, and Western Transport, which is on uh, summarised at page 1582, went the other way, but that was explained as being uh, decided on the basis that the uh, claimants hadn't acquired the copper with the intention of selling it, uh, but would have used it as raw material. And of course, in our case, the liquidators are very much on the BBMM side of the line because they were under a duty to realise these shares. The BBMM finance case is in the bundle and uh, owing to the shortness of time I can't go to it, but the um, relevant passages are from 412b to 413f, which are at pages 269 to 270, and that is tab 20. The next case on damages, and indeed the final case on damages, is a, is a case from the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal called Chamcat and Akai Number 2. In this case, shares were pledged to a bank as security for a debt. Which tab are we on? Oh, I'm so sorry, my lord. Uh, we are on tab. Twenty. Twenty-one. No, I'm sorry, I'm wrong again. Um, ignore me, that's wrong. Uh, it's tab 39. This was a case about shares being pledged to a bank of security for a debt. The, the reported pledge took place in December 1998. The default took place in December 1999, and upon default, the bank retained the shares. The bank sold the shares in April and May 2000. The shares were in an entity called Akai Electric, which was the operating subsidiary of Akai, which was the debtor who pledged the shares, or purported to pledge the shares. It was common ground that the measure of damages was based on the value of the shares at the date they were sold by the bank, which was April and May 2000. And the date of the conversion was the date of the sale. The Court of Appeal ordered damages based on the principle in, in BBMM that we've just looked at of uh, 20.5 million, which is what the bank received when it sold the shares. That's, that was entirely consistent with BBMM, i.e. the date of conversion is the date of the valuation. And as we've seen, applying that in the instant case, the equivalent date would have been the date the shares were misappropriated, because of course, although it's the date of sale in the Akai case, that was a sale by um, the trustee, so it wasn't it wasn't applying any kind of counterfactual of the sort that we've got in this case, where the beneficiary supposedly had to show when they would have sold the shares. So it's the date of the conversion, which was also the date of the sale. But Akai, the debtor, wanted still more than the damages of conversion that it had been avoided, uh, awarded, uh, and it wanted those on the basis of knowing receipt. And in, in bringing a claim in knowing receipt, the uh, debtor had hoped to get an earlier date of valuation, and they, they sought to get the date when the shares were pledged with the bank, which was December 1998, 
or the date when the bank had refused to give them back, i.e. upon Akai's default, the debtor's default, in December 1999. Now, it was held, in this case, that for the purposes of knowing receipt, the date of valuation was also the date of sale, and the reason for that was that Akai, the debtor, could have recovered the shares at any time before that date. And secondly, it was clear on the facts that Akai would not have sold the shares prior to the bank having sold the shares. Uh, and the reason why Akai wouldn't have sold the shares was because the shares were in its own operating subsidiary. So it was clear it wasn't ever going to sell shares in its own operating subsidiary. So again, that's not like this case where we were under a duty to realise the shares uh, and the judges made a finding of the fact that we would, have, we would have done so. Now, after that somewhat long-winded introduction, I'm now going to show the court the, um, the relevant paragraph from this case. It's a paragraph uh, 154 and I just need a moment to turn up the page reference. Page is page 789, my lords. Paragraph 154, it, it says, uh, in those circumstances, i.e., the shares were in the main operating subsidiary of the debtor, so cr critical factual issue that doesn't apply here. In those circumstances, it is clear on the balance of probabilities, indeed it is in truth clear beyond any real doubt, that if the bank had returned the share certificates to Akai, far from being sold earlier than the date upon which the bank sold them, Akai would have kept the shares until they became worthless. The ironic fact is that Akai is substantially better off as a result of the bank having received and sold the shares. Of course, that does not mean that Akai has no right to equitable compensation and the bank is entitled to keep the proceeds of sale of the shares. Normal equitable principles entitle Akai to elect between receiving a sum equal to the proceeds of sale of the shares, or unless it is impossible to obtain them, an equivalent number of Akai electric shares. And uh, in the next paragraph, um, uh, Lord Newberger, whose, whose judgment this is, um, uh, says that he would have been sympathetic to the notion that the equitable remedy would have to be refashioned so as to equate the amount of such compensation with common law damages had. Uh, Akai been entitled to more extra compensation than damages. So what I take from this, my lord, is that even if everything the Sheikh is saying is right, we're still entitled to extra compensation based on uh, the reasoning in this authority, which I respectfully invite your lordships to to adopt. And it, uh, and I, I emphasise the point that we really should not be worse off in equity against a dishonest fiduciary than we would be at, at common law. So, hang on, which bit of the reasoning do you say applies here? The bit, the, the, the bit where he says, of course, that does not mean that Akai has no right to equitable compensation and the bank is entitled to keep the proceeds of sale. Now, the only factual distinction we've got is that we don't actually know what the Sheikh or his entities got in uh, July 2017 in relation to these assets. But as I've shown your lordships, the judge uh, the judge accepted that there likely was some. I'm not sure I really see much of an analogy at the moment. Um, the bank sells the shares. The court says, well, you must be entitled to have the, that money. There isn't really anything quite analogous here. The only, it, it, I would say, I would respectfully submit that it's, it's entirely analogous apart from the Sheikh hasn't told us what he got in when he, uh, or when JJW Guernsey sold the shares or transferred the shares to MBI International Holdings. So and it's, it's not for us to prove that. Let's get this right. Mr. Ting dishonestly 
pledges the shares to the bank. The bank is held to have had notice uh, and is liable as a constructive trustee that when it realises the security, um, it has to it has to um, account for the proceeds of sale. Yes. What it was held that Akai can't do. Is this right? Is to. Sure, I do, I, I'm not sure I do see the analogy because um, I mean the point is that if, if if the shares had not been pledged to the bank in the first place, um, everybody agrees that Akai would have just hung on to them and they would have been eventually worthless because Akai failed in the sense of liquidation. Yes, so it's a it's a stronger case for the um, party doing the conversion than our case uh, because in our case there's uh, no evidence that we would have held on to the shares until they were worthless, if indeed, or that the shares even are worthless. Um, the but this, the, the bank didn't convert anything. The bank, the bank for whom I acted, um, simply was held to be on notice that it, that Mr. Fink didn't have the authority to, to pledge the shares to it. I mean, the bank is not a fiduciary other than as a result of knowing receipt. Oh, well, that's, yes. So it's, I'm not suggesting that it's it's the same as that the bank is in an analogous position to the to the shake. Um, my my understanding of that case is that the bank did convert the shares when it sold them. If 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 your lordships um, are not attracted by that point, then I'm not going to uh, waste time on it. But the, the 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 reason for taking your lordships to the damages cases is, is simply to to make the point that when shares are converted, irrespective of uh, subsequent events, it's the value at the date of the conversion at common law. And in my respectful submission, the judge was right to uh, apply the, the analogue approach for equity, which is a substitutive performance measure in our case. I, I don't think it's worth spending more time in Akai, but I, yes. if I look back at paragraph 123, we see there's a conversion claim as a result of which damages are to be assessed by reference to the value of the shares when they're sold. And when we come on to the paragraphs you were taking us to, where what, what the court was considering was whether you could, in equity, get something on top of that, and the court said, no, you can't. Well, it's not so much on top of, but you get a, a more attractive date of valuation. Something, <coughs> yes. Yes. And even if the, uh, the victim had, uh, would have held on to the shares, until they became worthless, they are still entitled to equitable compensation and indeed damages for that matter. That, that's all. That, that's that's yeah. all that, that, that case is about, but from our perspective. So that's, uh, that's everything on the law on ground two. I'm now going to make what I hope is a, a short factual submission about the 2016 JJW accounts, um, which may be found at. page 70 of the supplemental bar. This document was disclosed by the Sheikh. There's no suggestion that there's any that it's anything other than a, a, a proper document. This was the basis of the judge's valuation, applying a pro rata approach, just the same as the Sheikh had applied in the Statement of Affairs. They were audited by Ernst and Young, one sees it to page 71. They were approved on the 15th of May 2017, which your Lordships will, will note is um, after the shares go to JJW Guernsey in March 2016, and not that long before they go on to MBI International Holdings in June 2017. This is an independent auditor's report, and it is the 
Consolidated Financial Statements for JJW Inc. That's what it says. At the top of the page 71, it says, We, that's Ernst & Young, have audited the company and consolidated financial statements of JJW Hotels and Resorts Holdings Inc. Represented in the consolidated balance sheet of 31st of December 2016 and the re related consolidated statements of income, changes in equity, and, and so on. The reason I've taken your lordships to this is um, that there's a passage in here which is possibly not worded as as a as a, someone with English as their first language would perhaps have worded it, but nonetheless is is entirely clear in my submission what it what it means, uh, and it's been rather latched onto by the Sheikh as meaning something other than what it, in my submission it clearly means. That's at page seventy six, my lords. And under the heading general, it says JJW Inc is a company incorporated in BVI. JJW, Inc., is primarily owned by MBI International Holdings, Inc. And then this is, this is the passage that the Sheikh latches onto. JJW and its subsidiaries, comma, which are owned by MBI International Holdings, Inc., the group, comprise of the following entities. And then it sets out a whole load of entities. Now, it's said by the Sheikh that these accounts, which are expressed to be the consolidated financial statements of JJW, Inc., are actually not that. They are, in, they are really consolidated financial statements of MBI International Holdings because they say that that passage that I've just read out means that there are two pots, as they put it. There are things owned by JJW Inc. and subsidiaries that are owned by MBI International Holdings, uh, i.e. apparently not under JJW Inc. Now, in my submission, firstly, and I su suggest most powerfully, that isn't what the words on the page say. Next, these are the consolidated financial statements of JJW Inc., not MBI International Holdings, and were, if it included things that are subsidiaries of MBI International Holdings but not subsidiaries of JJW Inc., then these would be the consolidated financial statements of MBI International Holdings. There's no principle of accounting of which I'm aware that would lead Ernst & Young to include subsidiaries that are not under JJW Inc. in the consolidated financial statements of JJW Inc. I mean, it would be bizarre, because seemingly you would be including subsidiaries of MBI International, but not anything in the parent company. Well, absolutely. Um, yeah. It would, yes. Um, and as a cross-check, as a cross-check, I can invite your lordships to turn to page 32 of this supplemental bundle. This is... Um, Sorry. Oh, yes, yes. Yes. yes, it should be an organogram at page 32, yes. my lord. This, um, this is the organogram that was exhibited to the Standard Bank affidavit that the Sheikh we looked at yesterday briefly and the Sheikh was, was affronted at paragraph 8 of that uh, affidavit that people were on the other side of that case were, were suggesting he was unreliable and your Lordship will see Lordships will see on the right hand side the uppermost red box that is JJW Inc and your lordships will see in, in text just above that, 89% Sheikh Al Jabber, 11% MBI, BVI. I think we looked at this yesterday. The, the point I'm making here is that JJW Inc. is directly under, shown as directly under the Sheikh. And then all these subsidiaries, including JJW Guernsey to the left and, and in the centre, uh, all these subsidiaries are under JJW Inc. Now, I anticipate the criticism that is going to be made of this submission, which is that there was a, a gap of some years between this affidavit being sworn to this organogram and uh, the financial statements that we've just looked at. But yet again, at the risk of sounding like a stuck record, these are all matters that the Sheikh could have dispelled if they were not correct. And as the judge correctly found at, at 
trial. It was for the judge to dis uh, for the shape to dispel uh, these evidential uncertainties, lead evidence in answer to our case if he had disagreed with it. So to, is MBI International Holdings Inc. on this? Uh, no, but it's referred to. It's referred to as uh, in the text at the top right hand side where it says 11% uh, MBI BVI. Is that right, John? Oh, no, sorry, it's in the top left. Sorry, I'm, I'm wrong. It's in the top left hand corner. My apologies. Uh, so if one looks at the extreme left hand side and it's in red and it says 100% Shekhar Jabba, which is, is, is true. Sorry, we're sorry that, that's our company. That's yes. the company, not holding. Oh, sorry, I thought that's what you... I, I, no, forgive me, I thought that was the question. Uh, so going back to the accounts, there's a distinction between JJW and MBI International Holdings, Inc. Yes. Well, okay. MBI... Yes, so that MBI... That isn't on here. I'm sorry? That isn't on here. Or no, it's, it's not, and we, we, we don't know when it's incorporated. So okay. JJW, Inc. has... Um, JJW, Inc. has MBI International Holdings above it, and as we know, in relation to the 891,000 shares, that's the adverse transaction that this, this trial and this appeal is all about. And the, I think I do have the date for when the Sheikh's shares in JJW Inc. were transferred to MBI International Holdings. And I'll just turn that up if I may. It was, I think it was December 2011. Yes, 23rd of December 2011. I'm obliged, my lord. So that would have been shortly after this affidavit was sworn. But the fact that JJW Inc. has a new proprietor, a new parent, uh, doesn't affect the, the subsidiaries of JJW Inc. Why are you making this general submission, by the way? Because it's, it's said against me that the 2016 accounts that the judge based her pro rata um, valuation on um, do not support her reasoning because it's being said that not everything in those financial statements are part of the consolidated wealth of JJW Inc. Some of it is in a different pot, which is an MBI International Holdings pot. If your lordship doesn't understand that that oh, okay. that, that, that submission, then, then then join the club because I don't think it's a very I respectfully submit it's not a good submission at all based on what that document actually says. I suspect I don't need to take that any further. Um, if I can move on now to ground three, this is the unpaid vendors' lien point. Uh, your lordships have seen what we say about this. Um, we say it was it was unpleaded. Uh, secondly, we say, and distinctly from the fact it's unpleaded, it is in fact positively inconsistent with the uh, appellant's pleaded case. Uh, thirdly, the judge was right to find that the shares were sold free of encumbrance. Um, fourthly, and fourthly, the unpaid vendor's lien, any unpaid vendor's lien, is excluded by the nature of the transaction, namely that the consideration was not payable on completion and would only be paid from the fruits of the IPO. Uh, fifthly, if it did arise, then it was waived or at least postponed by the conduct of the Sheikh in the liquidation, and that behaviour is to be imputed to JJW Guernsey. The unpaid vendor's lien argument was not advanced with very much conviction at trial, and that's, in my submission, that's because it was entirely at odds with the Sheikh's factual case. Now, the reason it's taken on such a prominence on this appeal is because it is the failure of the demand letters in the June 2010 letter to come up to proof and the judge's finding that the February 2016 resolution was, an un, was a dishonest attempt to paper the transaction to give the appearance of it having been done in 2010, the failure of all that that has caused the Sheikh to bring the unpaid vendors lien to the fore. It's the only place he can go given those devastating findings of fact. Now this is not just a matter of pleading, it, it also my submission goes to whether the court should take the argument uh, seriously. It is, it is another example of the judge of what the judge described as the Sheikh changing his position when he perceives there to be a tactical advantage in doing so. so. I'm going to address briefly what was pleaded. And this doesn't just go to our pleading point. It goes to our, or, or rather our absence of pleading point. It, it also goes to the distinct point that the, 
pleaded case as to the transaction was positively inconsistent with any unpaid vendor's lien. Now, there is, there is nothing in the pleading, the defence, in my submission, about a security arising from the 18th of March 2009, i.e. the date of the transfer. The only security mentioned is one arising for the first time on the subsequent alleged deposit of share certificates uh, under the June 2010 letter. Now, in the defence, in fact, let's, let's go to the defence briefly. Uh, if I could invite your Lordship to turn to page 325 of the core bundle. Paragraph 15, there's, there's two uh, similar subparagraphs dealing with each of the JJAB transfer and the JJW Guernsey transfer. So I'll read just the first. An agreement dated 18th of March 2009. Or, sorry, the, the, the opening words. In anticipation of the IPO, subparagraph 1, an agreement dated 18th of March 2009 was concluded between JJAB and the company to sell its JJAB shares to the company for a consideration of 32 million euros odd, with such consideration being financed by the monies to be received by the company upon the IPO. So it's positively pleaded that that is the fund where the payment is to come from. Now in my submission that necessarily means that the payment isn't uh, to be made on completion, which is important. Just, just so we've got our orientation right here. Um, picking up a point I made to Mr. Crow, if you go back a page to paragraph 11, yes, suggest there that the IPO, which was defined, um, was going to be in a new, new uh, of the shares in a newly incorporated company rather than JJW Guernsey itself. That's that's the story we've always been told. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I I don't mean to interrupt. On I, th I I thought I was agreeing with your lordship on that. It was JJW Inc. that was regarded as the IPO vehicle, not JJW Guernsey. My understanding of Mr. Crow's case is as, as he summarised it just now. Right. Um, that, that is consistent with, or it's certainly not inconsistent with what we've been told over the last okay. several years, is that JJW Inc. was incorporated in order to, to do the IPO. It was to be the, okay, yep. So pay, uh, it's, it's specifically, or it's Im implicitly pleaded that uh, payment won't be made on completion. It won't be due on complete. Sorry, it won't be payable on completion, uh, and uh, it is to be funded from the IPO. Then over the page at three two six, page six, uh, paragraph sixteen. Each of the SPAs had been concluded on the mutual assumption and agreement by JJW Guernsey, JJAB, and the company, each acting by Sheikh Mohammed that the company must pay the consideration for the shares out of monies it received from its sale of shares in the IPO, and that if the IPO did not go ahead, the SPAs could be terminated on the basis that the shares continued to belong or would then belong to JJAB and JJW Guernsey. I would emphasise there that they are when it when it when it suits the Sheikh, he asks that one ignores the hats and simply um, treats us all as his, as his empire. Uh, but when it doesn't suit the shape, they, there's, a, there's a rigorous demarcation between corporate personality. Uh, so again, the money is, is it's said, coming from the, the IPO. Paragraph 18 refers to the demand letters. And uh, in the second sentence, it says, the entire rationale, rationale and purpose of the SPAs was to enable the company to generate returns in the BVI from the IPO and to use those returns to pay the considerations JJW Guernsey and JJ, JJAB. Now that the IPO was not taking place, that purpose was entirely defeated. Now, I respectfully urge your Lordships to uh, note the, the words uh, entirely, uh, in, entire in the third line and entirely in the final line, because again, that's important when we come on to the case law. <coughs> now, 
Now, if one studies the defence, I, I can't go through it line by line, but if, if one studies the defence, there are there's essentially three arguments pleaded. There's there's one based on retention of beneficial title. That was the primary way the case was put. Next, that there was a retransfer of beneficial ownership pursuant to the June 2010 letter. And uh, thirdly, that there was a security arising by deposit of share certificates under cover of the June 2010 letter. Uh, and that is uh, paragraph 22 to 24 uh, of the defence, but uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go there. There is, not only is there no express pleading of an unpaid vendor's lien, the pleading of the nature of the transaction positively excludes any suggestion of an unpaid vendor's lien. So, and it, on the basis of these first two points, you would have submitted to the judge that A, this was unpleaded, and B, it was positively excluded, and you got a ruling from her, um, um, and therefore this point wouldn't arise on the appeal. That's right, my lord, and I hold my hands up, we didn't take the point at trial. So, I, Lee Hawksworth says it's now too late. The situation we're in now is is wildly different from what happened at the trial. This this was this was very very faintly argued, and it was the the unpaid vendors lien was stood very clear at trial that the unpaid vendors lien stood no prospect of success in circumstances where it was so diametrically opposed to the factual case that the shake was running. That's saying I, it's a bad point, which is a different. And it may be right, but, well, but but the point you're on at the moment is it's unpleaded pleaded and excluded by the pleading case. Very good, my lord. I I, I do appreciate the the, the the difficulty in the submission, but it's um it does it it is it is galling that a point that was that was barely present at first instance, barely present at first instance, um <coughs> is is now essentially the main event. But um. There, there we have it. I will. I can see that the, the, the point doesn't attract my lord, so I will um, move on. Actually, be before I do, I'm just going to. I'm just going to say what the real prejudice was. Three, three points on real prejudice. We were unable because we didn't know in advance of skeleton arguments that the point was going to be raised. We were unable to obtain expert evidence about the BVI position on surrender of security and liquidation. Potentially important, given what the state of affairs is like. Secondly, I attempted to raise a trial but was not permitted to do so. The writing requirement under Section 68 of the BVI Business Companies Act 2004, um, and again, this, this was unfair uh, because we hadn't had a chance to get expert evidence on the point, and that was the reason I wasn't allowed to, to run it. Again, we, we didn't get expert evidence on that because the point wasn't raised until skeleton arguments were exchanged. Well, have you appealed that ruling? My Lord, no. It's, it's not a concealed cross-appeal, it's simply going to, to, to show why we, we have suffered prejudice by um, the point not being pleaded. Uh, thirdly and finally, uh, had it been pleaded, then we could have led evidence to show that the company's <coughs> creditors, uh, Imo Consultant David Britt uh, not least, uh, relied to their detriment on the fact that the company was held out as being wealthy between 18th March 2009 and 11th October 2011, when in reality, uh, it, as it was argued below, the Sheikh uh, knew that there was an unpaid Binders Liam. So move, moving on now to the, uh, the the free from encumbrance point. I'm not going to spend very long on this because we, we simply say the judge was right for the reasons she gave and um, give the ordinary meaning to the words. Uh, the, the, the fact that the instrument, in fact let's go to the instrument, it's at uh, page 10 of the supplemental bundle. This is the JJAB transfer, and I've, I've gone to it simply because it's a little clearer than the JJW Guernsey transfer. In the definition of encumbrance, all the all the work is is said to be done by the uh, the last six words of the definition of encumbrance at clause 1.1 on page 10, uh, namely 
or other third party interest <laughs> whatsoever. And it said, although this point wasn't made below, but it said now um, that that means that all the other uh, forms of encumbrance must be third party as well. Uh, and we say that that isn't what the words say, and unless there's a good reason apart from what the words say, then effect should be given to it. Uh, the instinct of the law is that outside of conveyancing real property, people should bargain for security. So there's no particular uh, interorum consequences uh, from uh, giving effect to what that uh, clause actually says. What can I ask you? What does the word other mean? Uh, it means another interest, or other. It means other, other than interest. what? Other than the, the ones that have uh, just been referred to, so something other than a mortgage charge, pledge, lien, hypothecation, security, interest, trust arrangement, option. So moving on now to uh, the next point to do with construction, which is the uh, structure of the transaction. The judge held, rightly we say, that the transaction was structured in a way that excluded an unpaid vendor's lien. Sorry, have you? Yes. It's the point you, you've just dealt with. I mean, in the definition of encumbrance we're looking at, yes? Yes. All of the things that are listed are then followed by the words or other third party interest whatsoever. I mean, is the suggestion simply that they therefore, that the whole thing is dealing with third party? That's the shake suggestion, yes. yes. That's the shake's so case. your answer to that is, I didn't think you gave an answer to the Oh, sort of my, my case is that the, 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 it, the plain words, any mortgage, charge, pledge, lien, etc., should mean, should, should be given effect as meaning any mortgage, charge, pledge, lien, etc. I mean, so, so you invite us to disregard the word other. You construe it as if that word was not present. Well, it means, in my submission, it means the same whether it's present or, or absent. That, that clause means the same whether that's there or not. So my next uh, argument concerns the structure of the transaction, namely that the transaction was structured in a way that excluded an unpaid vendor's lien. Now, the judge in our submission was right to say that the existence of a vendor, uh, uh, an unpaid vendor's lien would have thwarted the purpose and rationale for those transfers. And that's an entirely unsurprising uh, analysis. The company, in my submission, received title to the 891,000 shares, and JJW Guernsey and JJAB received what they bargained for, which was a promise to be paid on demand from the proceeds of a future uncertain uh, IPO exercise. They received all that they bargained for and the existence of a lien was inconsistent with the nature of the transaction. Now, that view is supported, strongly supported, by the documents themselves. The consideration for the shares was not payable on completion. It was deliberately left payable on demand. Um, I should say that there was argument below about whether the transaction had completed or not. There is no appeal from that. It's, it, it is common ground on this appeal that this transaction did complete. But the consideration was not payable on completion. And one sees that um, at clause 2.1, the seller hereby irrevocably transfers its legal and beneficial interest in the company shares to the buyer, free from encumbrance in consideration for those two million euros odd to be paid on demand by the buyer to the seller in such way that is mutually agreed by the buyer and the seller. So it's it's left it's left out in the in the ether and it's not not only is it payable on demand, but it's got to be agreed by the buyer and the seller. So that's the most unusual demand clause. That is weird. Um, <laughs> when it says in such a way, does that mean by an agreed mechanism? Is that the sense of it? Your guess, my lord, is as good as mine. I dare say the answer to this is going to be, well, the Sheikh was wearing all the hats. Because, of course, it suits him to say in this instance he was wearing all, all the hats. Um, I mean, it's a very strong pointer away. An, an, in, an intra-group deal of this nature 
it's a very strong pointer away from there being uh, security uh, under it at all. Because you know, as long as the entities are solvent and they're all controlled by a man wearing multiple hats, um, it can be left like this. It, it only becomes uh, an issue if um, there are creditors uh, who come in to claim the assets, which is what happened, and, and the assets are in my submission to companies. So a very unusual demand clause, but the, we don't need to get into who drafted this or why, why, why it was drafted in the, in the way it was. The point is this. I mean, you, mm. This is why you say, how can you have an unpaid vendor's lien when there's actually no yet obligation to pay? That's my case, yes. That's the submission I'm about to make. Okay. Yeah. So the consideration for the shares was not payable on completion. It was deliberately left payable on demand. And it was, this was because, as pleaded, it was done in contemplation of the IPO. And the, it's, it's, the, the money is to come in from a, from a, from a fund that does, does not yet exist because the shares have not yet been realised. And so in this respect... But, and just the, to be clear, I mean, this is, I'm, I apologise if I keep coming back to it and I'm just being slow on the uptake, but... Is everybody working on the assumption that these very shares are going to be sold as part of the IPO? I assume nothing when it comes to... Okay, well, sorry. Um, I mean, that, I, the only reason I ask that is because that's what appears to be suggesting, suggested in paragraph 16 of the defence. Is it was that, yes. that these shares would themselves be sold as part of the IPO? Yes. Well, uh, among yes. others... And if that's right, they would certainly have to be sold free of any lien. Yes, that's the approach the judge took, yes. But what, what is going to be said in answer, to that, or what is being said in answer to that, my Lord, um, is that uh, what Lord Justice Millet, as he then was, said in the uh, Barclays and Commercial Estates case, um, means that it, you, you can have a situation where there's an unpaid vendor's lien as between vendor and purchaser, notwithstanding that the vendor knows that his unpaid vendor's lien may need to be postponed to the uh, interests of subsequent onward purchasers. But if, if your lordship will just bear with me for a moment or two, I can I can di dispatch that, which is is the only the only point really on on unpaid vendor's lien, if, if if I may say so. Um, so the point is this, my lord: the consideration for the shares was not payable on completion; it was deliberately left payable on demand in the funny way that we've seen. Now, in that respect. This case is different from every one of the cases we've been able to find where an unpaid vendor's lien has arisen. In every case where an unpaid vendor's lien has arisen, the consideration is payable on completion. It's not always paid, that's the whole point, but it, that where it's not paid, it's the vendor forbearing from requiring the consideration to be made, but it is nonetheless payable on completion. Yeah, the clue is 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 in the name unpaid. I mean, it's it's unpaid when it's it's due to be paid. Yeah. My lord, yes. And if it's not due to be paid because you haven't yet agreed how it's going to be paid, <coughs> yeah. How does the lien arise? Quite so, my lord. Yes, you 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 have you have my point. Okay. Um. I will. I do. I do at least need to give your lordship the references to make this make this good in my remaining fifteen minutes. Um, I should say, just that before I come on to the cases, I would say, uh, make two points about uh, how, this was, how this was done below. Uh, the Sheikh relied at trial on the consideration not being payable. He's, he, that was part of his case. So if I could show your Lordships that, it's at page 230 of the core bundle. This was his sort of retention of title point. At paragraph 143, the judge records that the sorry, MBI... Was, I mean, the tally is the wrong place. 143. It's, sorry, I misspoke. I should have said 473. Forgive me, my lord. Uh, it's page 230. Yes, um, the MBI respondent's submission is recorded as being that um, 
a transfer would not take place until the consideration under the agreement had been paid because the parties had agreed that there would be no completion until that moment. Uh, so it is it, it's absolutely the Sheikh's case that, that the consideration is not payable. And as for demand, the second point about uh, the fact, um, the only source of any demand that has ever been suggested is the demand letters of the 22nd of December 2009, which did not come up to proof of trial. So there is no evidence of, even of demand having been made, let alone uh, demand as agreed between buyer and seller. So moving on then to the cases, firstly, Reed Brentwood Brick. This is in the authorities bundle at uh, page 35, and that is tab. Tab 35. No, it's page 35 at tab 5. Tab five. This is a case where an unpaid vendor's lien was excluded, and it's because the, uh, the, the sale agreement provided for the sale consideration to be paid in a particular way from a capital raising exercise in the purchaser itself. That's over the page at page 36, one sees that. So it starts about halfway down and it's that penultimate paragraph on the page starting with the words, the agreement was adopted by. And that just makes clear that the, uh, the agreement, reading from the last four lines, uh, the agreement is in consideration of the said sum of £6,000 to be paid to him in manner therein before stated. Uh, and that's having recited the, uh, the capital raising. So that, because consideration is not payable on completion, but it's to be paid from a fund that doesn't yet, hasn't yet come into being, that excluded unpaid vendors lien. Next, uh, Kettlewell and Watson. This is at page 51 on page 7. Sorry, tab 7. And, and, I mean, I know it's uh, uh, unconventional actually to go to the judgments in the case, but um, <laughs> I assume that it's towards the end of um, Lord Justice James's judgment that you rely on. That yes, I am Brentwood. Still in Brentwood, yes. All right. Um, my lord, it, it's it's simply a <coughs> fact the fact that I only have I only have ten minutes remaining to me. I, I, okay, I, we'll just, I apologize just, just, for that. Yes, would do. Sorry, yes, ignore sorry. my attempt at humour. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Just yes. If yes, say yes. <laughs> and apologies. Yes. So, uh, page thirty-eight is Lord Justice James's um, uh, judgment. Very, very, very short indeed. Um, uh, no day for payment this is halfway down uh, the very short judgment no day for payment was named he agreed to receive his purchase money if and when capital should come in he got for his property a charge upon and a right to the capital of the company to the extent of £6,000 when it came in uh, to my mind it is clear that he intended to rely on that fund for payment and intended that the company should have the means of borrowing this is quite inconsistent with the lien which would probably make the company unable to pledge their property uh, so that's it. It's it's that no. That's, that's your point. That's yes. your argument. Yes. Fine. Got thank, it. thank you, my lord. And um, if we could now move on to tab uh, seven at uh, page fifty one. This is a, a, a case that um, was explained by Lord Justice Millet in some detail in, in the Barclays and Estates and Commercial case that the Sheikh relies on in particular. This was a case where the vendor sold to a purchaser and the purchaser was to sell off the land by lots. Um, now, as Lord Justice Millet explained in Barclays and Estates and Commercial, that the fact that the, the payment was contemplated come out of the sub-sales didn't prevent the vendor having an unpaid vendor's lien. What the case actually turned on was that the vendor couldn't rely on 
of unpaid vendors lien against the sub-purchasers because the vendor's agent, a Mr Dibb, had failed to intervene in those sub-sales to assert the original vendor's unpaid vendor's lien. So essentially there's a standing by, a form of waiver or postponement. The critical feature of the case is, though, that the consideration was payable on completion. And one sees that, uh, and again, I'm going to, um, I'm going, I'm going just to uh, go to the summary first, summary of the facts at page 52. In the last paragraph on page 52, uh, it says, on the 15th of November 1872, a deed was executed by which the trustees conveyed the land as to one moiety to Richardson in fee, and as to the other moiety to Watson in fee. There was endorsed on the deed a receipt for two and a half thousand dollars having been paid. In fact, nothing was paid except the deposit of 223 pounds. Critically, the, the payment, the, the money is due and payable on completion as a matter of contract. Uh, it's forbearance rather than uh, the money left unpaid to be paid on um, well, Lord, uh, Justice, at a, at a Lord Justice Lindley just spells out what at page 57 of the bundle in the second sentence. Um, sorry, it's, it's the second paragraph, second sentence. Yes, duly, duly paid. Duly. Yes, yes, which, which might be mean, mean, means payable. Yes, quite, quite so, my Lord. Uh, the next case in this run is Capital Finance and Stokes. The bargain for deal in this case, the, uh, this is at page 169, which is at tab 15. The bargain for deal in this case was that the property would be acquired for 37,900, of which 25% was to be paid up front, and the balance would be left unpaid but secured by mortgage. And one sees that at uh, 264A to C, page 172. So in other words, 75% wasn't payable on completion under the contract. But the mortgage wasn't registered and was void. And so the question in the case was, is there an unpaid vendor's lien as a sort of fallback because the mortgage hasn't been registered. I'm just pausing there and returning to the facts of the current case. It's a bit like the Sheikh's position, where his pleaded case was that JJW Guernsey had security by way of a deposit of share certificates in June 2010. Uh, and that's failed very badly at trial, so he's hoping to fall back on an unpaid vendor's lien. Uh, the relevant discussion in capital finance is at page. Um, or rather the start of the relevant discussion is at page 186 at letter E this is, this is quite important my lords it, it, uh, just after letter E it says the remaining and most serious question is whether the vendor did not have an unpaid vendor's lien such a lien arises in the ordinary course in favour of a vendor who has not received the purchase money and it is the creature of the law and does not depend upon contract or possession. It depends on the fact that the vendor has a right to specific performance of his contract. The existence of the lien, however, depends upon the terms of the bargain between the parties and on the surrounding circumstances and may be excluded. So now I've, I've rhetorically asked what would uh, specific performance have looked like as at completion, there not having been a demand and there not having been an agreement between buyer and seller as to um, when the payment would be payable, when the consideration would be payable. Uh, there couldn't be specific performance of this contract on completion, for the sellers had got exactly what they bargained for. And of course, if there's no unpaid vendors lien on completion, one cannot be conjured into existence by a later demand when there hasn't been an unpaid vendors lien before. And indeed, in this case, no demand has been made. So that leaves us with Barclays and Estates and Commercial Case, which is at page 371. Sorry, page 369, tab 
the facts of this case were that £51,000 was left unpaid but due on completion. The conveyance contained a consideration and receipt clause. So it's forbearance again by seller, but the consideration is payable and accordingly susceptible to specific performance. And so for the contrast between this case and capital finance is that specific performance would have been available here, but not in capital finance as to the 75%. Another interesting point of distinction is that in this case, the son, who was the purchaser, was going to pay by other means if he was able to. So in other words, the sub-sales were not contemplated as the only source of payment. And that is evident from letter H on page 417. The evidence, which was unchallenged, of the seller was that when the property was redeveloped, the $51,000 would come in, sorry, would come out first, and then we would share the balance. If he could afford to pay it to me before development, I would get it. If not then, I would get it afterwards. So it's not, it's contemplated that the money's going to come from the sub-sales, but it's... But it's a case where the, it's a case where the £51,000 was due. Yes, and payable, yes. You see that at D. Yes. Conveyance contained a consideration and receipt clause, and Mr. Bensley's evidence is that the balance of £51,000 was due. You see that just above F. Yes, quite so, my lord. So, according to the contract, the money due. Yes. Yes, that's right, that's right. Not left to be negotiated by agreement between buyer and seller at a later point. No. This case is notable because there's the fairly long discussion of the Kettlewell case that I've already referred to, and that's explained by Lord Justice Millett as a species of waiver or abandonment amounting to a postponement. So we see that at I'm sorry, my lords, my computer is frozen at the worst possible time. Ah, there we are. Is it bridging 376 to 377 in the bundle? In the particular circumstance, it's been taken to be waived or abandoned. I'm obliged to my lord, yes it is. Yes, it is. Yes, waived or abandoned as against the sub-sales. Yes, I haven't kept up with it. Can I see it? Then over the page at 424. The judge says, having allowed, this is about 10 lines down on 424, page 378 of the authorities bundle. Having allowed Dib, that was the vendor's agent, to deal with the land on the footing their purchasers were selling as absolute owners free from the lien now insisted on, the plaintiffs could not assert their lien against the sub-purchasers. I have little doubt, however, that the plaintiffs could have asserted their lien against the immediate purchasers, so that, for example, had the purchasers become bankrupt, their trust in bankruptcy could not have sold the land to sub-purchasers. Now the question here is, what were JJW Guernsey and JJAB entitled to on completion? The answer is a promise to pay on demand to be mutually agreed between buyer and seller, at which it got. I would, but for the shortness of time, I would point out that the case being run on this appeal is wildly different to the case being run below on unpaid vendor's lien. Mr. Crow said that my client is, yesterday, my client is not trying to enforce the unpaid vendor's lien. He is simply pointing out that the value in the company's hand is nearly in real financing terms. Not having paid for them, it was always subject to the unpaid vendor's 
me in. We don't have time to go to this, but for your Lordship's note, the way this was argued at trial um, is at uh, page 137 and following of the supplemental bundle, where it was the way it was put um, on page 18 of day 19 in the supplemental bundle is that the existence of the unpaid vendors' lien meant that the dealing with the shares on the 8th of March 2016 wasn't void because it was a valid dealing under section 175. It, it was suggested that it was a, effectively a, a security enforcement uh, and that um, it was supported by the uh, statement of affairs. So <coughs> this, this no loss point, this, this suggestion that the shape is now being helpful in pointing out that um, some third party had security such that the value of the shares was nil. Um, so that although he doesn't appeal from the, um, uh, the findings of the fact, he's, he's nonetheless there's, there's no loss on his worst case. Very different case from that which we were confronted with at trial. The, even if the Sheikh can point out that JJW Guernsey had an unpaid vendors' lien, this is my last point, my lords, uh, he's not in a position to do any such pointing out in relation to JJAB. And we've never seen any evidence that JJAB's rights were assigned to JJW Guernsey. Unclean hands and waver, my lord. I, my lords, I must sit down and give my learned friend an opportunity to reply. So your lordship has seen what we've said about unclean hands and waver in our skeleton argument. And unless there is anything further with which I may assist the court today. No. Thank you, my lords. Unless there's anything further. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Uh, can I just start with a couple of slightly um, disjointed factual points um, before getting on to the three grounds? Um, various things were said about the 2017 transfers. Uh, and how little we know about them. Um, it is apparent from the judgment, if your lordships, um, in the course of considering your, unless you're going to give an extemporary judgment, uh, <laughs> considering your um, views, paragraphs 114 to 118 of the judgment, and paragraphs 259 to 260, and paragraph 541, all explain what the evidential material was. And in short, there was a debt owed of, I think, 600 million by uh, JJ Inc., which it could not afford to pay, and uh, owed by JJ Inc. to MBI International Holdings, which it could not afford to pay. Ernst & Young advised on the restructuring, uh, and the restructuring uh, was uh, duly implemented. And um, the only paragraph, I might just, I think I may have mentioned it before, but paragraph 541. Say JJW Inc. owed MBI International Holdings $600 million. And the judge was satisfied that that was a debt owed and reflected in the accounts. Reflected in the accounts? Meaning the accounts we've seen yeah. for the JJW Inc. Inc. Yeah. Yeah. So that's taken into account in the assessment of the net asset value. I mean, the, the balance sheet figure. Presumably it was. Um. And I've drawn to your attention paragraph 541, where, there, uh, where the judge um, makes the finding that there aren't um, uh, the, 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 the transactions uh, in 2017. Uh, do not constitute any um, uh, breach by the defendant. Uh, and um, it's just also worth pointing out in 541, so I think Merlin Friend was a little bit um, cavalier in which companies the Sheikh was a director of. It's recorded at the top of page 249 the Sheikh was not a director of JW Inc. at the time of the July 2017 resolution. So, 
take on. <laughs> no, I was just, I, I just wanted, because I, no, part I thought, of my learned friend's well, presentation hang on, hang on. was to try and raise a smell about the nature of... Sorry, the, it was Guernsey that transferred the shares, not JWW Inc. Yes, it was going to transfer the shares of JJW Inc. that transferred the assets and liabilities, and it's and it is that act that takes value out of the shares. Right. Okay. Right. Can, can we just turn up the accounts briefly? This is yeah. supplemental bundle tab sixteen, yeah. page seventy-two for the balance sheet. And I assume the six hundred million is the owner's current account at note ten. 595 million shown there. Yeah. Still producing a net asset figure of 681 million. Yeah. So how can you transfer assets worth um, 1.3 million, uh, 1, 1.3 billion is it, uh, for um, uh, Six hundred million. Uh, my lord, I am not making submissions on material that isn't in front of the court. I'm drawing to the court's attention two things. The first is that the, the, the judge had deployed in front of her arguments that the um, uh, uh, transactions uh, 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 involving the share transfer and the asset transfer were relevant to the conspiracy to uh, the unlawful conspiracy claim, and that argument was rejected. Uh, and I'm simply drawing to your attention the evidential material that was in front of the judge, including, as I say, the restructuring on the advice of Ernst and Young, um, uh, uh, because your lordship's asked if there was any information um, ab about the nature of that restructuring. And I just wanted to draw those paragraphs of the judgment to your attention. And I do follow that, but um, just pursuing it a moment longer. Um, do we have the advice from Lee Y? You don't. No, I don't <laughs> even know if it's uh, if it was available at trial. Um, but um, the other thing that I just wanted to point out, since since, since we're on this, is that um, although Melinda Friend has spent a certain amount of his time trying to raise a sort of a, a whiff of of, of um, impropriety around these transactions, could you turn in the supplemental bundle to page two three two, right at the back behind tab twenty nine? Paragraph 403 of his closing written submissions. In the instant case, the liquidators do not seek to bring a consumer derivative claim and do not rely on losses to JJW Inc. to grant any part of their claims. All the alleged wrongs were directed at the company, not JJW Inc. While it is now common ground between the parties that JJW Inc. has no assets, the MBI respondents allege that the liquidators accept and the liquidators accept that all JJW assets were transferred away from it in July 2017. There is no need for JJW Inc. to have suffered any wrong under the restructuring for the liquidators' claim to be made out. So it simply wasn't part of the, the mix no, but they're at not, trial. OK, two things. One is they're not saying that it didn't suffer a wrong. It's just saying the question of whether it did or didn't is relevant to their claim being made. Exactly. So it wasn't a matter upon which the court was invited to make a ruling. Can I go back for a moment, just um, if I if I may, because of course, as always, <laughs> of course, you're, you, you, you you slip so smoothly from one thing <laughs> to another. It's difficult to for the for the slow brain to catch up. You started this by saying that um, uh, there was a debt owed by JJW Inc. to MBI Holdings International, which it couldn't service. Yeah. And, but um, I'm looking at your organogram, trying to figure out what relevance that is said to have to the restructuring. Because the transfer of shares were shares in JJW Inc. by JJW Guernsey. Yeah. So how does that? I don't know. How does that um, connect with a debt owed by JJW Inc. to MBI? I, I, I don't the, know. The, the JJW Guernsey should have decided to dispose of its shares. No. It, it, so, hence my puzzlement at, at the start. I mean, I don't see the connection. Well, Lord, I am not trying to argue a point or prove anything 
that yeah. wasn't part of the trial. Okay. I merely wanted to point out, because one of the questions from the bench was, do we know anything about this restructuring? No, but and I just wanted to draw to your attention what you do know. OK, the other thing I don't get is, if JTW Inc. owed money to MBI Holdings, International Holdings Inc., which it, said, which it couldn't service, it said, yeah. um, how, how is it helped in any way by transferring its assets to JJW UK, a company which is owned by MBI UK? Um, I, it, it, it is transferring assets and liabilities. My green text is not okay. complete. Assets and liabilities. I don't, yeah. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure you can transfer liabilities, just if we're being accurate. But anyway, it, whatever it did, I'm not sure whatever that transfer involved, the green asset, I, I can't see why that's connected to a debt which JJW Inc. owed to MBI Lord, International Holdings. As I say, I'm, I, I'm not able to answer any questions. That no, it, it just seemed at the start as if you were going to be able to. Oh, I'm <laughs> That's so a very sorry, confident sorry. way in which you started. I know. Um, I know and, no. and I just was sucked into it. Um, oh, well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint, my lords. I just wanted to show you what was in the judgment. <laughs> I offer nothing more. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is what isn't in the judgment, because occasionally um, uh, 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 suggestions were made about documents being backdated. Um, there is no finding in the judgment that any document backdated, and there is no finding in the judgment that any document is forged or false. Oh, well, yeah, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're being, if I may respectfully say, <laughs> accurate. Um, you're being <laughs> very accurate to a very precise degree, because yes, it's true, there was no date on the document of tab 13 or 14, yeah. so in that sense, it was not, quote, backdated. Um, there is, at page 67 of the Supplemental Bundle, at paragraph 2.9, the assertion um, by the Sheikh that he had ascertained that the instruments of transfer that he himself had signed were signed for and on behalf of the transfer on the 6th day of July 2010. Yeah. And the judge has said that is untrue and yeah. false. Yeah. So you may be technically accurate that he didn't actually put the data on the documents of 13 and 14. But... The suggestion that he was not trying to represent those documents as having been executed in 2010. I, the judgment says what it says about the findings of credibility about the Sheikh. I merely wished to ensure that the court was not under the impression that documents had been backdated. Um, <coughs> the other thing, uh, just in terms of how material emerged, but um, and again, you may um, uh, be well aware of this. Um, several references were made to the share register only being produced or the, um, uh, the account of the 2017 uh, share transfer and uh, asset transfer only being produced on the fourth day of the trial. Um, if you look at page 117 of the um, core bundle, which is if, just the... If, if, I, if I gave that impression, that was not my intention. We, the, the, 2017 transfer we knew about from December 2017 when we got the so-called PETCH email. What we didn't know was anything after the 23rd of June 2017, in particular July 2017. And that's the passage from the uh, judgment on amendment that I invited your lordships to read uh, yesterday. Um, sorry, to so clear. So you, you knew about the 2017 transfer. Well, there were two transfers in 2017. Yes. Which one are you referring to? Crucially, well, well, there was a share transfer. Yes, on the twenty third of June, twenty seventeen. You did know about. We it. did know about that. We were shown. You, you say you didn't know about the asset transfer. Didn't know about the asset transfer, and critically, crucially, we didn't know anything about the shares after twenty third of June, twenty seventeen. So we didn't know what had happened in July, twenty seventeen, other than what the Sheikh told us, which was that he had caused the, the shares to be transferred from JJW Inc. to JJW UK. And that was the misapprehension we were labouring under until part way into the trial. So you meant asset transfer? The asset, an asset transfer, asset which and we weren't told it was an asset transfer until the fourth day of trial. We put further copies, iterations of the share register were disclosed on the 1st and 2nd of February 2021, which was the day before the trial started on the 3rd of February 2021. But that, the, share, the most recent share register even then, 
showed the position on the 26th of March 2020, nearly a year earlier. So we did know about the 23rd of June 2017 transfer, but we didn't know anything after that. And this is all set out in, in considerable detail in the liquidator's favour in the judgment on amendment, which is in the supplementary bundle that I drew your Lordship's attention to yesterday. So I apologise to my learned friend if I gave that impression. That was, that was certainly not what I intended to do. I'm very grateful. Um, so uh, early February, um, the uh, claimants do know about the um, asset transfer. And if you are on page 117, you will see the hearing dates of the trial. Yeah, we have finished till 18 months later. Exactly. And there was an adjournment after February which was followed by very extensive amendments made in April. In fact, I think there was a trip to the Court of Appeal about the extent of the amendment. And clearly a deliberate choice was made not to join MBI International Holdings uh, or JJW Inc. at that stage. I just again want to point that out as a matter of the chronology of the case. Just with those points, can I then turn to ground one? Ground one is entirely about the question whether or not the Sheikh owed any duties. So one asks, well, where do the duties come from that the joint liquidators are relying on? The first point we make, and my learned friend doesn't, can't answer this, the first point is that no duties are owed purely by virtue of the Sheikh's office as a director of the company, because Section 175 says so. The second answer is that no fiduciary duties arise by virtue of Category 2 constructive trusteeship. There's no dishonest assistance and there is no knowing receipt. And I would emphasize no knowing receipt because again, there were some suggestions in Milan and Friends submissions. There was some question about whether the Sheikh had or hadn't received anything. There was no pleaded case and there was no decision that the Sheikh received anything. And indeed in his oral submissions at trial, Milan and Friend expressly also said he was not attempting to pierce the, any corporate veil. Well, he says on appeal, his case is Category 1. Yes, exactly. So I get to that. Uh, indeed, I think, in, in fairness, that was his case at trial. So in what respect, bearing in mind Section 175, in what respect is the Sheikh a Category 1 um, a constructive trustee? And the phrase, phrases that have been coined uh, in order to um, capture uh, uh, the, the joint litigation <coughs> case is intermeddling or assuming the role of um, a, 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 a fiduciary. Intermeddling, we would suggest, is, is I think what Lord Assumption um, would be inclined to call a portmanteau term, meaning it's not itself a category of anything. It's a label to describe a collection of legal concepts and the legal concepts we suggest that it captures are category two, constructive trustees, and if this is different, trustees to some tort. When I say category two, I, I, I mean knowing receipt, dishonest assistance for the purposes of this trial. So we would suggest intermeddling involves either category two, constructive trustees, trustees to some tort, or possibly de facto directors. Now, assuming the role or whatever um, uh, the expression, and it, 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 it is a language, I think it was put to me by, by my Lord Justice Snowden, um, and it may have been uh, a, a deliberate echoing of the words used in, in a number of the cases, Byers uh, uses that expression, assuming the role, in paragraph 93. Did the Sheikh assume the role in the sense of being a trustee to some tort, properly so-called, no, because the case law is consistent and very clear 
that a trustee, the Sontort, properly so called, is only responsible in relation to trust property they receive themselves. And, the trust, and, and that isn't the case. So, in order for um, the um, joint liquidators to establish a, the existence of duties by reference to the shake assuming the role of a director of the company, they have to point to him doing things that only directors of the company could do. Like transfer it, like executing a share, share transfer okay. in respect well, to an asset owned by the company. Your lordship is, is, is ahead of me. I was going to start at the other end of the <laughs> transaction. Registering a transfer in the books of JJW Inc. cannot possibly be described as an act that only the directors of the company could perform. Now, if, if the Sheikh owed duties, we would be having a different debate about whether entering the share transfer in the register of JJW Inc.'s books constituted a breach of that duty, but we are having the anterior argument as to whether there's a duty at all. And if the duty is being founded on an allegation that the Sheikh was a de facto director because he did a de facto director of the company and therefore owed the duties of a director to the company. The fact that he, if he did, procured the registration of the share transfer in the books of JJW Inc. simply cannot found the existence of duties owed to the company because it cannot on any view be described as an act that only a director of the company could perform. So we are left then with the act, as my Lord Justice Snowden um, uh, 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 suggested a moment ago, that it's the act of signing the share transfers that constitute um, uh, uh, the relevant act that generates <coughs> a duty by reference to the concept of a de facto trustee. Now, in our submission, if you analyze the concept of assuming the role of, however you, 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 you choose to describe it, assuming the role of a, of, of a director, what the case law all talks about, and logically, because this must be the concept, is that the person is doing something which can only properly be done by a de jure director of the company. That's what a de facto director is. He's somebody who is performing functions which can only properly be performed by a de jure director. De facto director, in a sense, is a director in all but name <coughs> who exercises legal powers that are vested in the de jure directors. But once one accepts that as the concept, the sheikh is in exactly the opposite position because he was a director, but only in name, and no powers were legally vested no. in the de jure directors, because Section 175 said so. He presented these share transfers as having been executed in 2010, mm. when he was the de jure director with untrammeled authority to act on behalf of the company to execute. The act that is said to give rise to the existence of fiduciary duties, as found by the trial judge, is signing the resolution in, uh, well, sorry, is, is signing the share transfer forms as found by the judge during 2016. But attempting to pass them off as documents which had been executed at a time when he would have had the power to do so in 2010. But the one has to analyse whether or not a duty exists or not by reference to what the findings of the trial judge were. And it is undoubtedly the case um, that, uh, 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 well, let me put it this way around. The um, breach is not said to have occurred in 2010. The breach is said to have occurred in March 2016. So it is whatever the Sheikh did 
in March 2016 that supposedly gives rise to these duties. As at that date, the directors of um, uh, 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 the company had no legal power to dispose of um, the shares. And so in presenting it to JJW Inc., a share transfer form in March 2016, the Sheikh was not doing something that only the directors of the company could lawfully do. No, he presented it to the, the board of JJW Inc., i.e. himself, um, as something which had been, had been done by himself at a time when he would have had the authority and the power on behalf of the company to do that which he presented it as. But it is being presented in circumstances where the transfer had not been made in 2010. No, but he, he presented the, the transfer forms as having been yes, made. Yes, but he's presenting them in March 2016 when the directors have no power to effect a transfer. The, the, the day the document is typed has nothing to do with it. The, the finding of fact by the judge is that in March 2016 is when the document is, um, uh, uh, or, or February 2016 possibly, is when the document is passed uh, um, from the Sheikh to JJW Inc. And at that stage, JJW Inc. knows that no transfer has been registered before then, no transfer therefore has been completed. So the Sheikh is purporting to do something that the directors of the company can't do. And in our submission, it is simply incoherent to suggest that you can owe duties as a de facto director by doing something which the de jure directors can't do. Um, there are some, I, I mentioned the relevant paragraphs from um, uh, Paycheck uh, when I was um, uh, uh, opening yesterday. And I just wanted to um, take you to a couple of those uh, very shortly. So it's in the authority volume uh, bundle at tab 38. And it's a useful judgment simply because it, it quotes a number of earlier ones, uh, in particular. Um, Lord Justice Millet, I think, in Hydrodam. Um, and if we can get up to tab 38 uh, and just look first of all at page 704. <coughs> um, and if we look at the bottom of para 39, just by letter H, as Mr. Justice Millet, sorry, as he then was in Hydrodam, the, the liabilities imposed on those who were in a position to prevent damage to creditors by taking proper steps to present their, protect their interests, as he put it, those who assume to act as directors and who thereby exercise the powers and discharge the functions of a director, whether validly appointed or not, must accept the responsibilities of the office. It is, in our submission, just logically impossible to suggest that a de facto director, well, the, 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 the label of de facto director, can be applied to somebody who purports to do something which is not discharging the functions of a director because directors don't have any functions by virtue of section 175. Oh, I guess more of the same at page 719, where we actually get a quote um, top of uh, uh, page 719. Um, uh, we actually get a quote from Hydrodam. A de facto director is a person who assumes to act as a director. He is held out as a director by the company and claims and purports to be a director, although never actually or validly appointed as such. To establish that a person was a de facto director of a company, it is necessary to plead and prove that he undertook functions in relation to the company which could properly be discharged only by a director. And that simply does not describe um, the Sheikh in 2016. And finally, at page 721, um, paragraph 93 in the speech of Lord Collins, the judgment of Lord Collins, um, let us see. The crucial question is whether the person assumes the duties of a director and then various earlier authorities are mentioned. 
and just a um, few lines down with a reference to Fayer's legal services, an unreported decision of Mr. Justice Patton, as he then was, rejecting a claim that the defendant was a de facto director of the company that had been breached of fiduciary duty, said that in order to make him liable for misfeasance as a de facto director, the person must be part of the corporate governing structure. And that's an expression that, that um, features in, in Fayer's, which I think is in the bundle as well, uh, and indeed has, has antecedents before that. None of that in our submission um, is, is uh, a, a, um, a, a, a description that can probably be applied uh, to uh, the shade in this case. Uh, tab, uh, Fayers is, is in tab 31, I'm grateful. Um, the only um, other cases that, um, that I just wanted to mention, my, my learned friend in the course of his submissions took you to Williams and Central Bank of Nigeria. Um, uh, 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 what we get from paragraph 9, your attention was drawn to paragraph 9, um, what we get from that uh, is what we suggest you would also get if you had occasion to read the Lionel Smith article we handed up, which is that uh, um, directors are described as Category 1 constructive trustees because of their powers, or their legal powers of stewardship. Now, my Lord Justice Snowden put to me yesterday, well, you can owe a, do a, a sort of no conflict duty or a no profit duty without exercising powers, which is true. And on reflection overnight, um, I, I, I think maybe I, I didn't express the point we we're trying to convey. What we say is that you can only owe fiduciary duties if you have legal powers. It's not that you only owe fiduciary duties by exercising a legal power, but if you haven't got any legal powers, then the no profit rule and the no conflict rule can't arise. So you've got to be clothed with legal powers. Um, uh, 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 and, and in our submission, one does, does get that, as I say, from the, from, from the Lyle Smith argument. And that, that is a, what we submit is underlying uh, the Williamson Central Bank of Nigeria case. And similarly, in Burnden, which was the other case you were taken to, um, uh, uh, paragraph 11 of Burnden, again, tells you that a director is treated as a steward because of the powers of management vested in them. Um, and uh, so uh, we submit that those cases support our analysis. Uh, and the fact that um, uh, 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 the directors in a BBI company, for whatever reason, I mean, this case is it's, it's about BBI law. We don't know why that legislation was enacted um, ad, ad, as it was, uh, but um, uh, we just have to take the, the law as it's stated there and work within that. The only other thing we just wanted to say about Burnden's, my learned friend was trying to suggest that there is virtually no difference between that case and this. There is absolutely all the difference in the world between Burnden and this case because the relevant acts of supposed default in that case occurred pre-liquidation when the directors were in office and had powers vested in them. It is precisely has the feature that is missing in our case. Um, the, so, so in a sense, to, to, just to kind of try and wrap up on ground one, the way we would suggest um, your lordship's approach it is, is to accept that pre-liquidation, <coughs> the property of the company clearly is vested in the company, but the power to deal with it is vested in the directors. Post-liquidation, the property is still vested in the company, but the fiduciary stewardship power vests in the liquidator. Uh, and uh, so absent, uh, uh, sorry, so post-liquidation, unless the liquidator um, instructs or authorizes a director to do something, the directors of a BVI company in liquidation simply do not have a fiduciary relationship, uh, and it can't be conjured from an act which is itself of void and of no effect. Least of all, as I say, looping back to the entering into the register of um, uh, uh, JJW Inc., a fiduciary duty cannot be founded on an act done in a capacity other than as a director of the company. On ground two, 
Um, I have drawn your attention to paragraph 403 of uh, Milan and Friends' written closings um, that uh, his case at trial uh, was that JJW Inc. had no assets, uh, and we do submit that the only fair reading of the judgment, paragraph 5573 and 574, is that the judge accepted that. And as we've also seen uh, from that same paragraph in my landed friend's closing, uh, the joint liquidator's case uh, was that they did not need to explore whether the 2017 asset transfer uh, involved any wrong. Some of my learned friends' submissions appeared to be making a different case now and appeared to be trying to go behind what was said uh, in paragraph 541 of the trial judgment without actually appealing it. So, loss. In our submission, the analysis must proceed with a suitable degree of intellectual rigour by looking at what is said to have been lost by the breach of fiduciary duty. The shares. The shares were transferred. Milan and Friends argument is attempting to achieve recovery by complaining about a different loss. He is not basing his claim for equitable compensation on the loss of the shares. He is asking for equitable compensation to be calculated by reference to the loss of the value of the company in which the shares are held. And that, in our submission, um, is simply an illegitimate attempt to get the court to answer a different question. And it explains why I balked at the suggestion that my argument about um, uh, 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 the current value of the shares involved some sort of reliance on a break in a chain of causation. It doesn't. It re our argument depends upon insisting that the court should focus only on what flows from the breach. The breach is the transfer of the shares. If the liquidators had wanted to make a case that the diminution in value of the company in which the shares were held was part of the breach, or that it was a separate breach, a pleaded case would have had to have been made, and the judge would have been asked to rule on that. And it's perhaps relevant in that context just to pick up that paragraph in Libertarian, which my Lord Justice Snowden put to me, and which my learned friend relied on, just to see, in a sense, how little <laughs> use it is to my learned friend uh, in present context. It's in tab 46 at um, paragraph 93, so it's page 943. <coughs> and indeed, the very fact that it follows from um, citations of Dawson and uh, of um, Canson which are stating basic equitable principles about the um, uh, uh, quantification of, um, uh, uh, of loss. It is clearly not intending to say anything different from those cases. And what it says in 93, paragraph 93, is where the plaintiff provides evidence of loss flowing from the relevant breach, the onus lies on a defaulting director fiduciary to disprove the apparent causal connection. I'm the right in assuming that you're also relying upon what's said at 91 on the previous page, the loss is assessed at the time of judgment. It, it, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, and the court is entitled to take into account any post-breach changes affecting the value of the lost trust property. Exactly so. Exactly so. Th there is no evidence that the loss flowing from the shares flowing from the transfer of the shares caused the diminution in value. It just wasn't part of the liquidator's case. And indeed, in that paragraph we saw in the closing, they positively disavowed that. So Malone Friend cannot, with respect, rely on what is said in paragraph 93 
um, of uh, a libertarian. Just dealing very briefly with the other case law, his argument on Target and AIB seems to be that somehow they are an arcane um, uh, uh, area of law dealing with um, solicitors in con conveyancing transactions. With the greatest respect, it, that simply does not stand up. The both decisions use expressions such as the basic equitable principle and the principle of equitable compensation. Of course, they discuss the facts of the case in hand and how those principles apply. But the principle <coughs> that you get from both of them is that the SETI K Trust is only entitled to equitable compensation reflecting the loss flowing from the breach. And that is what the liquidators have failed to prove in relation to um, their claim for 67 million. So we submit Target and AIB are, in their own terms, self-evidently stating general principles. They applied Canson and Dawson, neither of which are solicitor conveyancing cases, and both, again, also clearly uh, apply general principles. And they were applied in Ahmed, which, again, was clearly nothing to do with solicitors and conveyancing. It was dealing with exactly the issue you have in front of you, namely the diminution in value of shares wrongfully transferred out, uh, the diminution of value between the date of the transfer out and the date of trial. The fact that the shares in that case were transferred back is a factual difference, but it makes no difference of principle whatsoever. I mean, if the shares were transferred back in this case, they would be valueless. The question is, well, what's the equitable compensation? Can it capture the diminution in value um, absent proof that the diminution in value of the company is caused by the breach of fiduciary duty. And it, 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 I have to say, it, it caused us a certain amount of amusement on this court that Milena Friend was trying to distance himself from Ahmed because it was in fact cited at trial by him in his opening and his closing as the relevant authority and applicable to the facts of this case. And with respect, the other cases that he cited, Davis and Ford, particularly in the Court of Appeal, um, if you, when, when you do have an opportunity to go back, Court of Appeal, Davis and Ford, which is bundle, um, uh, page 1446, I don't have the tab number, I'm afraid, but paragraph 128 clearly is treating Target and AIB as stating generally applicable pr principles for uh, the quantification of equitable compensation. Um, yes, and the, the other cases, Bairstow, Auden McKenzie, and Davison Ford, those were the, the, the other ones. Both Auden um, McKenzie and Bairstow are dealing with an entirely different point. They are dealing with the argument by a defaulting fiduciary, well, yes, I did take an unlawful distribution or a, an unlawful payment, but I could have had it paid to, my, paid to me lawfully by way of a lawful dividend. And what the court says is that um, uh, uh, the, in, in assessing equitable compensation against a defaulting fiduciary, the defaulting fiduciary is not entitled to ask the court to assume hypotheticals that didn't happen. There was no lawful dividend paid in Auden Mackenzie, uh, 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 and um, uh, the, the same point as you see from um, uh, Bearsley, paragraph 54, the same point is being made there. Our case is exactly the reverse. We are not asking the court to take into account things that didn't happen. We are asking the court to do exactly what the court says uh, in um, uh, Target, and as we just saw um, in uh, uh, um, Libertarian, is to assess at judgment with the full benefit of, benefit of hindsight, uh, taking into account what has happened. Um, very briefly, if I can just have two minutes, because I, I started slightly later than my, my, my allotted 40. Um, I mean, Learn Friends spent a long time on 
um, authorities dealing with damages on conversion. The one thing that is absolutely clear from Dawson, from Canson, from AIB, and from Ahmed itself is quite simply that equity takes a different approach from damages at common law for breach of contract or for tort, precisely because equity is doing something different. It's performing a different function. So analogies with tortious damages are simply inapt. If you want a particular paragraph, we would be fond of in Ahmed paragraph 38, where that point is made. Um, ground three, I opened very shortly. Melinda Friend dealt with it at greater length. But I think you have our points, essentially. Um, it, it, it was a point that was argued in opening and in closing, and the judge ruled on it. So plainly, it's in the mix. It's too late to try shutting it out. Um, the judge decided that BVI law is the same as English law, and that ruling isn't appealed. So the only question is, was there an unpaid vendor's lien? I don't think our submissions will uh, improve by uh, re-reading to you Barclays Bank and um, uh, commercial, uh, Estates and Commercial, or by re-reading to you uh, the terms of the share transfer agreement. Uh, we submit that an unpaid vendor's lien arises when a debt is owed under a contract of sale. It doesn't have to be immediately payable. It, is, it arises because the debt is owed, and it's security for the debt that is owed. It may not be enforceable until the debt is payable, but it can't only arise when it's payable. And so, um, and, and, and indeed, that exactly that point is, is made in Winter and Lord Anson, um, which is in the Authorities Bundle, tab one, at page five. It's the very last paragraph on page five. Uh, and similarly, we would suggest that in capital finance, where my learned friend took you to uh, Authorities Bundle, tab 15, uh, page 186, nothing is said about the Leon only arising when um, uh, the consideration is due. Okay, uh, just, just to be pretty sure we don't want to finish. I think the point is if on completion you get what you bargained for. Yeah. And you've agreed that a, a sum of money can be left outstanding and paid at some future date. You don't have an unpaid general's lien for it. Um, if you have, I think the way we would try and express it is to say uh, that an unpaid vendor's lien can be excluded if a vendor accepts something other than the agreement to pay as his consideration. So if he accepts some other form of security, or if he accepts, um, well, another form of security is, 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 is the classic one. And, and we do urge your lordships to read carefully, because my own friend read um, some of the background cases. But to be honest, we, we would suggest that Barclays and Estates and Commercial, um, which discuss the earlier author discusses the earlier authorities, particularly Kettlewell and Watson, is, is the prism through which all of this can be analysed. And we, we, I, I, as I say, I, I, I don't think we need to, 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 to labour that point any further. Can I just briefly take a prompt? Yes, I'm reminded Brentwood um, it was a case in which a charge was given, which rather illustrates the way I was trying to put it, that if you accept something other than the agreement to pay as consideration, then the lien is, is excluded. I'm grateful. Unless there are any questions, more questions from the bench. I don't detect any. I think, Mr. Fenimore, you must have a right to say something should you wish to add anything. Which I <coughs> might hope you don't wish to, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take no offence, my lord, I don't. Know. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you all very much for uh, interesting and testing uh, arguments. Um, contrary, I'm sure, to what you're expecting, we will reserve our judgment. Um, uh, in in accordance with what is now the practice, uh, it will eventually be handed down electronically rather than in a courtroom. Again, in accordance with uh, practice, you will be supplied with it in draft uh, for you to correct our English and typing, but not to uh, re-argue the case. Uh, we would be grateful, of course, if at that stage you would seek to agree an order dealing with consequential matters. 
if there are points on which you disagree, could we please have short written submissions and we would expect to deal with the points in the order that we make. Uh, finally, and I'm sure you're very familiar with this, I ought to remind you of the importance of abiding by the embargo and the uh, importance which this court attaches to that being done. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you.